He's right here, live in the studio. Let's welcome Floris Nijdam. Please welcome our esteemed speaker to our virtual stage. Floris Nijdam. Thank you for tuning in, I guess. Uh, today, we're going to talk about how you can take control of your digital innovation. Uh, I've been working in the digital industry for about 15 years. Uh, I've seen many different industries and companies from the inside, both B2B and B2C, uh, specialized in B2B over the last few years. Um, currently, I work at Info. We're a digital innovation company, business innovation company. Uh, we do consultancy, strategy, design, and development. Uh, so check us out if you like. Um, so the question actually I want to ask first, uh, relating to the statement I make in the title of this thing, is can you actually control innovation? Uh, well, the way we see it is that innovation is something that's very unpredictable. And you all make turns left and right, and you don't really know where you're going. So we believe that zooming out a little bit and getting an overview of everything that's going to happen in an innovation process from start to finish will help you reach the center. You will still have to figure out how to get there, but at least you know the size and sort of the general direction that you need to be going in. So that's why we made this four-phase approach, and it describes actually the entire innovation process, all the way from your first initial idea up until when you scale it up and it's business as usual in your company. And I'm going to walk through those steps. There's a lot of steps in there, way too much to handle today. So we also have this digital handbook that you can download on our website. Uh, I will repeat this in the end. Uh, for now, we'll just take some highlights out of this, and uh, uh, I, I will explain how those go. Now, before we go into this, let me just briefly reflect on innovation in general. Uh, what do we mean with that? Uh, what we do not specifically mean is that it always has to be a groundbreaking invention. Uh, uh, what we mean with business innovation is actually the process of transforming your company, changing your company, and improving it in order to deliver extra value to the world around you by doing something new. That is an important aspect. So that being said, let's get into it. So let's go to the first phase. Uh, the first thing you want to do if you have an idea for innovation is check out whether the idea is any good. Uh, and uh, this is what we call the explore phase. And you want to prove this and also prove it to the people that will help you get to the next phase where you can actually make it. And I want to highlight basically the first three steps uh, today, um, which has to do with actually figuring out what your idea should be like. Um, so this is a model made by IDEO. Uh, it's another design company in, the, in the, I think, the United States. It's a good model we use often, and it basically says what your innovation has to sort of comply to. And it's, it says that you have to be a viable solution, which means that it's sustainable over time and money-wise as well. It has to be feasible, which means that you can, uh, can make it, that you're good at it. But it also says that it has to be desirable. This is very important and often really neglected. And we actually think that's the first thing you should start with. Um, why is that? Because you want to make people change towards your innovation, your idea, your pro product or your service that you want to launch uh, or that you want to introduce. Uh, so, and that has to be so desirable that people do not only want to make the change, but you want to make the change enough to actually ch change their behavior, actually, which is quite a thing to do because most people are very lazy and are even lazy enough not to get up uh, and reach for the remote to change the channel sometimes. So you have to keep this in mind. Um, we also noticed this while working for Growficient. Growficient is a small company that's helping growers uh, with uh, data input on their crops so they can improve it. Uh, and uh, we were focusing a lot on the technology, putting sensors in greenhouses to get better data points, et cetera, et cetera. But we had a super hard time convincing these growers that it was a good idea. They saw the potential, but still they were very much used to the way they were doing things. So we sent in a service designer and really check out what the day-to-day -day situation is like. And this gave us very valuable insights on the moment specifically when uh, they could use this information and when it would be really, really helpful, uh, allowing us to make iterations and get into a model that actually uh, we were able to test and get enthusiasm for. And this allowed us to actually deploy this in five different greenhouses now, and it's up and running in the proof phase, actually the next phase. Um, so this is very important to really research everything very well. Uh, and I want to make one note on that, is not everybody can do uh, this type of research. You need somebody who knows what they're doing. Um, there's a big difference between what people say, what people do, and what people say they do. Uh, confusing sentence, maybe, but it uh, has a lot of meaning to everybody who asks the questions and who knows how to ask the questions right. Um, that being said, 
once you have a good concept, you want to go into the phase where you actually prove it to other people. Uh, you want to make a business case and a good story. And I'm not going to, going to go into detail on that, but I do want to say this. A business case is about numbers and making everything uh, uh, make sense. So it's check, 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 check. And a story is actually what convinces people uh, to make a decision usually. Uh, yeah, you need to have some good visuals, some good exp examples. This is where the evidence comes in uh, that you have from your exploration. And uh, make a good story about it so that you will also persuade people to put in the extra effort to go to the next phase. The next phase is the proof phase, what we call it. This is the phase where you actually build your product or your service, and you make it, you, and you go live, and you see how it works, and improve it until it actually makes uh, it works the way you want it to. Uh, again, I want to zoom in on the first uh, steps here. Um, the from the for exploration phase, you probably have a lot of ideas of what to build and what to make and what to what to create. And what most people do here is actually look at how relevant things are to the problem that you uh, discovered in the first phase and that you researched, and say, okay, we need this to solve the problem, and then we need uh, uh, to make it. Uh, and we want to do this as cheap as possible because we're not really sure whether it's going to work. And this is where usually your problem arises because uh, this is what people mostly call an MVP, a minimal viable product, uh, but people are lazy again, right, remember? So you need to make it in such a way that they're actually going to change their behaviors. It has to be desirable enough to actually uh, make the change. Uh, so that's why we make it a little bit more fancy, a little bit more neat, and make sure that the customer experience is really good. Um, so this allows you to scope your product, build it, go live. There's a lot of work in there, and we're going to skip that for now. And then it's time for champagne, right? Well, not really. Um, you're not done. Uh, because when you go live, many things will go wrong. You need to improve. Things will go differently than you expect. Uh, and you need to uh, learn and adapt for that until you're able to go to the next phase. So we also noticed this when working for the NS Railways. Um, uh, they have this uh, bike sharing system on their stations. It's very popular. They were having an issue with people losing keys. And they had an idea to innovate. and put digital locks in there. So we helped them with that in, in, uh, and uh, put it out in the market on a small scale. Um, and then we noticed that uh, we've sort of not taken into account the fixing of the, uh, of the bikes. Uh, there's an operation, uh, the process flow for fixing bikes and a system that needed the improvements. And on the other side also, although it's very user friendly opening bike locks with your chip card, people still had the questions. So if you would scale up this, uh, the current state without changing these things, the questions from people for customer service and also the problems with the maintenance flow would go up as well. So you need to, we needed to fix this first uh, before we can uh, move on. And we're doing it actually quite uh, right now. Uh, so once you have launched this and everything is running smoothly, you can go to the next phase, which is the scale phase. Uh, in the scale phase, let me please quickly clarify why we call it scale and not specifically grow. So grow is obviously when you have a, uh, an idea in the market and you want to do more in that market. And usually that means that you have to put extra resources in there or add features to your product or service to make sure that whatever the market is doing does it more. Um, while scaling obviously means that you take sort of the same product and bring it to different markets. Um, the good thing is about digital that uh, copy pasting an idea more or less is relatively cheap. So that's why it's very convenient for us to do that in the digital uh, world. Um, I'd like to zoom in on the first steps again. Uh, if you would do this, if you scale up and you want to launch your product in different markets, uh, it's very important to have a good foundation uh, for two reasons mostly. Uh, one is that you need to have a technical foundation that's strong enough to deal with the wide scope of places. Maybe it's ge geographically uh, worldwide. Uh, and you need to uh, put your thing out there and it needs to be, you know, it needs to keep running smoothly. But also your internal processes, the people there need to be able to deal with everything uh, that's coming in. And it need to be flexible enough also to deal with cultural changes and differences in all these markets. So there will be slight adaptions also in the way you manage uh, things. So this is very important to check before you uh, roll out further. An example of this is when we were working for Takeaway. Takeaway uh, purchased uh, in Germany a Lieferando open day and they had a loyalty shop. So they, they brought this in and basically went through the proof phase with this thing to check whether it would work for all their, uh, their country that they're in. So they didn't really do that innovation themselves. They sort of acquired it. But, uh, and, it was, and it worked very well. So they wanted to scale it up and be able to go worldwide with it. Um, the thing is that solution was able to grow, but it wasn't able to scale uh, because 
they hadn't any features to deal with differences of uh, different business rules for different marketing teams, and also the technical stability wasn't good enough. Uh, they couldn't integrate with their own systems, et cetera, et cetera. So we needed to help, help them rebuild the entire thing, in this case, to uh, be able to do that. And we're rolling out right now. Um, so this is something that you normally want to avoid, building something entirely new, especially when you do, in this case, they inquired it. But uh, if you do it yourself in the handbook that we showed, there's also some ideas very early stages already that you can do to prevent having to rebuild something completely if you make the right decisions early on. Um, this leads us to actually, uh, once you have it up and running and you're, uh, you have solidified your base and you have a good foundation and you can roll out the different countries one by one, and at one point you will start to see patterns there. Uh, some things will be the same every time, some particular things will be different every time, uh, and uh, you will see sort of, okay, how you, how you can manage that, how you can do that, and this allows you to make sort of an organizational strategy to move on, which brings us to the final phase, is the normalization phase. This is basically how things get business as usual. Um, now, on one hand, this goes by itself. On the other hand, there are some things you can do, specifically on terms of how you're going to optimize and integrate into your processes. So this is also where digital transformation comes in. There's a lot of things that you have to do for digital transformation, but one thing is actually also being data-driven and having your people uh, act really quickly and agile on what's going on. So I want to zoom in on that a little bit. Um, what most people already do, most companies already do, is have their Google Analytics or whatever the digital uh, service or platform or product has and measure that. We think it's also very important that then take that data and say, oh, hey, you're, this is what's going on here, and then see why it's going on there. So you do your qualitative research. You go back into the field and check, like in the explore phase, and see what is going on really. What's the problem here? Why is this going wrong, or how can we improve this? This allows you to uh, design a new, better solution and make it and improve it and then test what's going on again. This is a continuous cycle. So this is a way we can do continuous optimization. Um, what will also happen if you do this is that you will notice that if you have been working with external companies, like for instance Info or maybe consultancies or whatever, this is something that happens quite, on, quite a lot with innovation processes, uh, that you want to internalize this. Because it doesn't make sense that if something's business as usual, that you keep putting money outward of your company, right? Uh, so you want to insource the daily operations. And an example of this is when we work for Greenwheels. We're still working for Greenwheels. We, we did that for seven years now. And at one point, the continuous optimization of specific things didn't make any sense. So, and the way that we brought it back, this is, might be interesting, is that we uh, used blended teams. So first we had our teams doing it, and it was continuous optimization. Then we did it in blended teams, and now they're doing it themselves. And uh, this is a good way of internalizing uh, technology and also a transfer of knowledge as well. Um, one thing that you want to be uh, 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 make sure that you still have your connections to outsource resources for new ideas and fresh ideas, because what sometimes happens is that if things get too uh, uh, internalized, that you won't have any new ideas and new fresh ideas. Um, so that being said, it also brings the benefit that uh, if your own teams are doing this optimization, you will also spot your own opportunities. This is really nice because sometimes these opportunities are just basic tweaks and improvements, but sometimes they're like, whoa, there's something new here. There's something, there's really something going on, which basically brings you back to the first phase. So this innovation process is also a cycle. Um, so that being said, um, I hope this overview of everything that's going on will help you a little bit getting more control of what's going on in your innovation process. Um, if you want to have more details, please check out our handbook on our website. And uh, thank you for now.